So welcome to the Department of Psychiatry Grand Rounds. Today's event is co-sponsored by the USC Center for Mindfulness Science. Before we go to our speaker, I'll make several announcements and then hand over to Dr. Rael Khan, who will introduce our speaker for the day. As you see, we'll be, may I ask that everybody please mute? Thanks. Today we'll be enjoying a presentation entitled Enhancing Well-Being and Mindfulness via Ultrasonic Modulation, Philosophical Challenges and Clinical Applications by Dr. Jay Sanguinetti from the Universities of Arizona and New Mexico. As always, I'd like to remind everyone that we have continuing medical education. You can obtain CME by looking in the chat box at the end of the presentation for how you can log on to Qualtrics and uh, qualify. Please note that the evaluations must be completed no later than Friday at 5 p.m., at which point the link will become inactive. For continuing education, the Department of Psychiatry is approved as a sponsor for continuing education for psychologists, LMFTs, and LCSWs to earn CE credit Licensed therapists must be present for the entire program and complete an evaluation. Similarly, you'll be able to find that link in the chat box at the end. Please note that today's Grand Rounds is worth one CE credit. We apologize the flyer mistakenly noted 1.5. Again, please note that the link will become inactive after 5 p.m. Friday. For today's program, the information and materials presented in this session belong to the instructor. Grand Rounds presentations and materials will be distributed to members of the Department of Psychiatry. There are no conflicts of interest to report and there is commercial support for one experiment, and Dr. Sanguinetti will cite this in his talk. Before we move to the presentation, I'd also like to take this opportunity to remind everyone in the department who works at County that we will be doing the provider time study in June from the 1st to the 14th, and it's absolutely imperative that you list all of the activities you perform on behalf of the county facility during this time, whether they are done in person or remotely. And we can now move to the main portion of our presentation, and I'm happy to introduce Dr. Rael Khan, who will tell us more about our speaker in the program today. Thank you so much, Dr. Siegel. Uh, so welcome to everyone, both in the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, thank you to Barbara and Dr. Siegel for uh, facilitating this co-sponsorship with the Center for Mindfulness Science. Also welcome to those of you who have heard about the talk through the Center for Mindfulness Science. As uh, many of you uh, with the center may know, this is Dr. Sanguinetti's second talk uh, sponsored by the center. The first one was two weeks ago. The original plan was for Dr. Sanguinetti to come in person two weeks ago and give one Grand Rounds uh, co-sponsored talk and one talk uh, for the center on the main campus. And this is uh, in lieu of the second of those talks which will delve into the realm of mindfulness, the conceptual domains, uh, really what is mindfulness and 
uh, the difficulties, challenges, and successes in mapping that question into both psychological uh, kind of formulations as well as the neurophysiologic uh, underpinnings that may or may not be directly related. And of course, you know, some interesting uh, philosophical questions come up in regards to the study of those subjective domains of experience uh, that are encountered through mindfulness practice and the change in subjective experience. There's not only the changes in equanimity and emotional stability uh, and the felt experience of being in the body in the moment, but there are also interesting changes on the experience of self. And this is one of those areas where you really get into existential questions that uh, to purport that they are mapped in a direct one-to-one -one way uh, onto brain states is a bit of a stretch for some people. And it is also one of the key questions that those of us studying the neurophysiology of meditation and mindfulness are confronted with on a regular basis. And in some ways, Dr. Sanguinetti's work is really at the cutting edge of that question because of his interest in applying neuromodulation to the training in mindfulness so as to see whether there are possible uh, uh, beneficial boosting effects of changing brain circuitries in the, in the, through physical manipulation. So um, just a few extra words of uh, introduction for Dr. Sanguinetti. Um, his training was in philosophy, neuroscience, and cognitive psychology and dissertation investigated the neural processes of conscious and unconscious visual processing, uh, specializing in psychophysiological measures, EEG, fMRI, visual perception, emotion, and um, especially over the last year's mindfulness meditation. Uh, his team has been investigating novel forms of brain stimulation, including the use of ultrasound and light-based stimulation to enhance memory, perception, and well-being and in particular, uh, well-being through the modality of uh, effects on mindfulness. Dr. Sanguinetti has published widely from topics on the neural basis of vision and temporal dynamics of perception to understanding how the brain changes in Parkinson's disease and schizophrenia. And current interests are largely focused on non-invasive brain stimulation to enhance cognition and well-being. Current focus of investigation is whether focused ultrasound neuromodulation can augment mindfulness practice. And this work is being in, done in collaboration with Shinzen Young, uh, a long time uh, and well known and respected meditation teacher who's joining us uh, for the presentation today. Um, Shinzen and Jay are co-directors of the recently launched Sonication Enhanced Mindful Awareness Lab at the University of Arizona in collaboration with the Center for Consciousness Studies at the University of Arizona. This lab is developing accelerated mindfulness protocols for th therapeutic interventions to treat addiction, chronic pain, and depression. So with that, I'll just mention that it's been a real pleasure to get to know uh, Jay over these last few years in the uh, mindfulness and meditation research community. And one of the things that I most appreciate about Jay is the, the fact that you know, he had the opportunity to make a lot more money and uh, kind of have open uh, blue sky research uh, possibilities in front of him with uh, Silicon Valley funding. Um, uh, but in order to do so, he would have had to take a, a leap out of academia and some of the more rigorous uh, questioning of the, uh, the, the foundations of this area of research looking into uh, uh, changing brain activity as a mode modality to enhance uh, mindfulness and change in, changes in awareness. So instead of uh, continuing on that path, as he saw, there was a, a, a potential uh, conflict of interest with making money versus doing work that would really have a solid scientific foundation. He brought himself back to academia and um, is now running uh, this lab at University of Arizona doing similar work, maybe with a little less uh, access to free uh, kind of money uh, without re regard to, uh, to ethics. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so it's really uh, commendable uh, that Dr. Sanguinetti has made this uh, transition and uh, and I think you know there's a lot to uh, to be said for the the rigorous investigation with an open mind towards the possibility that using these kinds of techniques may or may not uh, have direct uh, effects on enhancing the different components of mindfulness. But until we do the research, we can't we cannot you know final accounting cannot be made. So it's really a, a pleasure to have you with us to share your work today and these different. Uh, perspectives. I hope I haven't laid too big of a challenge for you to try to meet in that introduction. Thank you. Well, thank you for that introduction. It, it is quite a challenge, but it was a beautiful introduction. I'm glad we're recording this. So I could just use that introduction for my next talks going forward, I think, because you covered every point perfectly. So thank you for that. Uh, let me share my screen here. Um, uh, before I do that, I just wanted to thank uh, Dr. Khan again for inviting me here and for the Center for Mindfulness Science uh, for setting up this talk and the invitation, and also to the Department of Psychology for inviting me to the Grand Rounds. Um, of course, I would love to be there with you in beautiful sunny California. Um, I'm in sunny California, but it, sunny Tucson, but it's a little bit too sunny here. It's, it's 100 degrees outside. So I'd love to be there with you, but I think it's great. We have 130 people on the call and I'm starting to really appreciate uh, the fact that Zoom calls like this allow more people to experience these talks and the science. Um, so I'm happy to see so many people on the call and I thank everyone for joining. Um, so I have about 40 slides, uh, which I hope to get through by the end of the hour. And then um, as Dr. Khan said, we have Shenzhen Young on the call as well who co-directs the lab that I run at the University of Arizona. So Shenzhen's really our contemplative scholar expert. And if you have questions afterwards for him, um, he can answer those. And I can answer all the scientific questions you have. And we hope to have about 30 minutes for that at the end. So let's see if I can share here. Okay, can you see my screen and no notes? Yes, okay. Um, so, as was mentioned, I'll be talking about our current research attempting to combine um, a form of brain stimulation called ultrasonic neuromodulation with mindfulness training. And as Dr. Khan pointed out, uh, there's a lot of interesting philosophical and scientific questions that emerge from this research, uh, which, you know, some people might sort of run from those types of questions, but Shenzhen and I, and I think Dr. Khan as well, really love to steep into those types of questions. Um, so if, if I don't bring some of that up during the talk, please ask questions afterwards and we can talk about those. Uh, the research is mostly being done now at the Center for Consciousness Studies um, in Tucson. And some of the work I'll show you today was actually conducted at the Mind Research Institute at the University of New Mexico. And uh, as Dr. Khan mentioned, I am not making any money off of this. I have no financial disclosures to mention. Uh, one of the studies was funded by a private company and I will mention that. So I'd like to start uh, with the father of modern psychology. This is William James. And he says, could the young but realize how soon they will become mere walking bundles of habits, they would give more heed to their conduct while in the plastic state. We are spinning our own fates, good or evil, and never to be undone. Um, I love this quote because William James is really getting an, at an idea, I think, that resonates with most of us that our habitual thoughts and feelings and actions build into our habits of mind and that those habits then shape our actions and ultimately shape who we become. Now, as we know today, a couple 120 years after uh, James said this, um, that never to be undone part was actually not right. We know that the brain is in a plastic state, meaning it can change until we die. And we know that the brain changes with experience. And so if you learn some effortful task, like learning how to play the piano, uh, we can detect changes in your somatosensory cortex, your motor cortex, and other areas like memory areas. And so today what we're going to talk about is another form of mental training called mindfulness, uh, mindfulness practice. And you can think of this as another way of changing those habits of the mind and as, Rael, as Dr. Khan was pointing out, also that may change the brain. 
uh, through these neuroplastic changes. And so we'll dig into that a little bit. Uh, but first, uh, doing good science, we have to define what we're talking about. Uh, mindfulness in and of itself is a, is a multifaceted concept and construct. Um, it defines a word, being mindful, a form of awareness, all the way to a set of practices and a lifelong path for some people. And so I really want to focus in on talking about a form of awareness called mindful awareness. And in a very broad sense, you can think about this as a certain way of paying attention to your inner inside and your outer, your field of experience. Um, now that's a very broad definition that would be very hard to study that in the lab. So I'll hone in on that definition a little bit. But this certain way of paying attention can be a state. So you can have a state of mindful awareness or you can have a trait level of that form of awareness. And what that means is that you have a baseline level of mindfulness that can then be trained and you can elevate that level of mindfulness going from states to traits. Now this in the science is the big question mark. How do you go from state to traits and how does the brain change? And we can talk a little bit about that. Now, one reason I like to work with Shenzhen and why we're co-directing this lab together is because um, he's really developed a fine grained analysis of the components of mindfulness. So you can think of these as three core, content, uh, three core attention skills, uh, like sensory clarity, which is being able to track what's happening in your sensory stream. I like to think of a baseball player who has developed the skill of watching a baseball at 100 miles an hour and hitting that baseball. So you can do that for external stimulation. You can also do that for your internal phenomenology and tracking everything that's happening at time. Uh, concentration power is basically your ability to focus on what is relevant. So you may be wanting to focus on me now and your cat jumps in your lap, which has just happened to me. Um, being able to hold your concentration on my voice is your concentration ability or power. And equanimity is the ability to allow your sensory experiences to occur uh, without pushing them away and without sort of holding on to them or grasping onto them. Uh, you guys had uh, Dr. Dave Vago a couple weeks ago give a, a speech in this lecture series. He defines equanimity as an even-minded mental state, so regardless of the affective valence. So whether you're experiencing something pleasant or unpleasant, equanimity is being able to have this sort of even-minded attitude towards it. And what I find really interesting um, for, for psychological interventions is that the development of this skill of equanimity um, really could have positive clinical outcomes. So um, you can develop something that's called decentering in the contemplative literature, which basically means as you develop equanimity, you sort of get this mental space, this mental distance from things that typically would trigger you. So if you think of someone who's got an emotional reactivity problem, for example, having a little bit of decentering allows that to occur but then they don't get so sort of swept away by that experience. And then that obviously can lead to uh, cognitive reappraisal or healthier processing of stimuli, for example. So uh, the idea here is that these three skills can be developed and through mindfulness practice, obviously, and that they work together to create what we can call mindful awareness. So this certain way of paying attention is through these skills. Now, um, there have been tens, uh, almost 10,000 studies published looking at the effects of mindfulness or trying to look at the brain effects of mindfulness as it changes both behavior and brain and the body. That's from uh, physical health, improving immune function, all the way to working as a clinical intervention um, for things like uh, chronic pain, which I think the evidence is pretty good for that. And I will mention we're talking about an eight week course of mindfulness interventions. This is usually called mindfulness-based stress reduction. Um, so within eight weeks, you can see a reduction in symptoms like chronic pain. You can see an enhancement of things like attentional control, so cognitive functioning, attentional switching, um, emotional regulation. And then within at least eight week, four or eight week courses, you can also see an amelioration of psychiatric symptoms like uh, symptoms related to depression or anxiety. So there's relatively good evidence. Uh, this field is still young, even though there's a, a whole lot of studies that have come out in the last 20 years. 
Um, we still don't quite understand the mechanism and sort of what's changing in the brain, but we can say within at least an eight week course that you can get a reduction in symptoms in the clinic. Now, if you continue to practice uh, for years and years, as Shenzhen and I talk about, that tends to lead to what are called trait level changes in a dimension we might loosely call human flourishing. Uh, so this is your depth of uh, happiness deeply and broadly defined, your sense of meaning, uh, life satisfaction, self-compassion, and ultimately um, the, the sense of self and sort of the identity of the self begins to change, which within the right context that leads to deep positive health outcomes and mental health outcomes. Um, so that's sort of the deeper effects from very long-term practice. Those haven't been so well studied. Um, I just want to give one example of, of how developing those core skills <clears throat> can lead to effects in the clinic. Uh, so let's, uh, let's imagine we have a patient who has some negative mood states, which leads to rumination, so negative self-talk. And then that could lead to persistent mood disorder. So this may look like depression. Well, those patients may not realize that their negative self-talk, their negative body emotion, the way that feels on the inside, and that negative mental imagery, sort of their self-image of who they are, is sort of all tangled together in their experience. Now, the claim here is that with mindfulness, you can untangle with concentration and clarity, and you can unstick with equanimity. So you apply these skills to this situation, and that tends to look something more like this, untangle and unstick. So now you have negative self-talk, negative body emotion, and the patient has some of that sort of mental distance that I was talking about. So they don't get so wrapped up in that experience. And really they, those experiences don't interact and uh, sort of multiply in the system. Um, so that's one way that you can lead to reducing something like rumination. Now, that would tend to work at least in eight week courses in the clinic. Yet, uh, if you think about a patient that is, is dealing with chronic pain or really deep, persistent negative mood states, uh, it's really hard to get patients to sit through an eight week course or even a two or four week course, to be honest. And so um, Shenzhen and I were looking at this problem and thinking about, well, do we have a way to uh, facilitate the mindfulness paradigms so we can actually bring those benefits, open up those benefits to patients in a shorter amount of time. That would then motivate them to continue the practice outside of the clinic and receive these longer term benefits. And so the fact that mindfulness is difficult is really in the beginning, at least for patients, is our motivation for this research. And so what we've been doing is uh, looking at a new form of brain stimulation or neuromodulation called ultrasound, uh, focused ultrasound. And basically what we're doing is we're sonicating the brain. So that's just ultrasounding with low intensity ultrasound to attempt to enhance the acquisition of those mindfulness skills. So these skills here that we are discussing are trying to be enhanced um, with this application. So I just wanna give you two or three slides on what focused ultrasound is so you can orient towards it. Um, this is a very fast growing field. There's tens of tens, 20s to 30s of papers coming up um, every few months. And the basic finding is that if you focus a beam of low intensity ultrasound into the brain, you can modulate brain function. You can perturb brain function for a short amount of time. Now the advantage of ultrasound over something like magnetic stimulation is that you can focus it to a very specific point, a millimeter precision, in this case to the motor cortex of a rabbit. And you can actually cause preferential movement, so in the paw on the left, and you can cause the paw on the, on the right to move. So you can be highly specific with this. And if you're using low intensity, so below about one watt per centimeter square, then you expect not to do any long-term change to the brain. You're, you're not doing any negative things to the brain at those low intensities. Of course, if you use high intensity ultrasound, you can ablate brain tissue, and that's done as well. But we know the limit, and we know what to stay below. Uh, now, our lab and others in the last couple of years have taken this technology into human um, brain stimulation. Here, what you see is a lab that's using a single channel transducer to attempt to focus a beam into the ventral thalamus. So this is basically one of the deepest spots you can go in the brain. And they're doing this from outside. So you don't have to do any invasive surgeries or anything like that. And you can see how focused this can actually be. 
Now, they wanted to know if they could actually reduce, so inhibit somatosensory evoked potentials. Uh, so stimulating with a little finger touch and you're recording with EEG. And what you see is by modulating that intermediate circuit, the thalamus, you can actually reduce uh, with transcranial ultrasound relative to shame. So this has been replicated uh, across different labs and different types of human paradigms, and it's really a growing technology. Um, our lab in the beginning was really interested in trying to use this uh, transcranial focused ultrasound tech to develop into an intervention for depression. So our first studies were in healthy humans. We, we ran about 300 subjects when I was a graduate student, uh, all perturbing the right inferior frontal gyrus, which is involved in inhibitory control and emotion regulation. And the basic finding was that across those studies, we could actually manipulate mood. We could make people feel better. Now, in this study, we wanted to know um, what does the connectivity to that brain region look like? So we're ultrasounding into the right inferior frontal gyrus here, and we're asking what brain regions are connected at rest. This is looking at functional connectivity. So who's talking to who in a functional way? We did two minutes of ultrasound at that same region, and after ultrasound, you can actually see a massive reduction in functional connectivity. Uh, so this was the first study to actually demonstrate that you can change functional connectivity up to about 20 minutes with this technology. And now we're investigating this as an intervention for depression, and that's independent of mindfulness. So um, we sort of developed this interesting technology along with several other labs, and we sort of had this, this tech that we thought could modulate in a safe way various uh, depths in the brain. So Shinzen and I started talking about this and talking about that problem that we want to help more patients with mindfulness, and yet we can't get the protocols to work. Um, and so we started asking the question, can we actually use technologies like transcranial ultrasound to facilitate mindfulness training? Now, it turns out that Shinzen um, is friends to a lot of scientists and collaborators to lots of different labs. And he had actually developed these ideas um, a long time ago, thinking about using different technological interventions to facilitate mindfulness practice. And so uh, we started talking about this idea and about what, what could we do, what brain regions or what, what constructs would we try to change in the brain in order to facilitate the practice. Now, if you're using ultrasound, um, there's a couple different ways you could think about doing this. You could think about enhancing mindfulness by, um, by exciting brain activity, which you can do with ultrasound. Another way to think about it is using inhibitory ultrasound, actually make excitability less likely and try to inhibit something that's getting in the way of mindfulness training. So there's sort of two ends to that. Um, and we don't quite know the parameters for that in ultrasound, so I want to be honest about that. It's still a new tech, but we have some ideas about how to excite versus inhibit. So Shinzen and I were thinking about this and sort of looking at the field, looking at the science that was out there so far, and it wasn't really clear from the science, um, you know, what, which, which uh, brain regions we could target in and of themselves. We really needed to think about this from the conceptual point of view and move backwards. And so we started thinking, well, if we could induce temporarily a state of equanimity, then we actually should be able to help people learn these other two skills faster. So if you have a baseline elevation of equanimity while you're trying to meditate in the clinic, for example, you should be able to learn how to track your sensations through sensory clarity and hold your concentration. And our assumption, our hypothesis, is that that should then carry over after doing the mindfulness training. And so um, this is how it looks. You excite one, uh, then you get the other ones coming along. And so we started thinking about, well, what networks in the brain would be related to equanimity? And we decided, well, there's actually networks that interfere with equanimity. So we're looking at the default mode network, which is really related to self-processing. And I'll talk about that in a bit. And we're talking about the basal ganglia, the corticobasal ganglia loop, which is involved in habit formation, as William James was talking about. And our idea is that these two systems, in certain contexts, can actually interfere with equanimity. If you could temporarily inhibit them, you could give someone a taste of that equanimity while they're training, and they could get a boost in the practice. And so this is what the idea looks like uh, in our brains. 
So uh, inhibitory ultrasound would be sent into the non-equanimity hub, so like the default mode network. Our first hypothesis is that would enhance equanimity, We're removing a barrier to equanimity. The second hypothesis then is that we should be able to enhance the training of mindfulness, so concentration and clarity, by enhancing equanimity. So if you're following here, we're inhibiting an inhibitor, we're releasing equanimity, which should make it easier to train in the other mindfulness skills. And then that leads to positive behavior change in the clinic, which ultimately would lead to well-being. So that's the picture of the sort of hypothesis chain that we're testing. And right now we're at this point. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. We were going to start testing this point uh, this year, but of course, like all of us, uh, this global pandemic has slowed things down a little bit. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the default mode network. I think as most people know, uh, this is related to an idling process. So if you're not doing a task, you tend to go into what's called the default mode. It has to do with self-talk, with mind wandering, planning for the future, um, the brain regions involved actually have to do with all kinds of other cognitive processes too. So this is a highly debated area um, in, the, in the sciences. Probably has to do with switching between internal and external, for example. But what we know is that there's likely core hubs in this system. And if you look at the network of brain regions, the idea would be if you can inhibit one of these core hubs, which is here and here, posterior cingulate, medial prefrontal cortex, you could actually uh, downregulate the integrity of the system for a short amount of time. And I want to be very clear, we don't want to um, permanently change the default mode network. We don't want to permanently downregulate the connectivity. We want to try to do it while people are learning meditation. So the hypothesis is if you can take this offline with transcranial ultrasound, the whole system has less sort of integrity. And while the person's trying to meditate, that should help them with the meditation practice. So uh, why do we think that's even a possibility? Well, if you look at long-term meditators who have somewhere around 10,000 hours or more of meditation practice, you pop them in the MRI scanner and you look at their brain deactivation, what you see is that while they're meditating, so these are different types of meditation uh, techniques, those two hubs, those yellow hubs, PCC, medial prefrontal, those turn off or, or down uh, activate relative to baseline. So that's when people are actively meditating. Now, um, and of course, when you look at controls, you see almost the opposite. That area actually activates. Now, if you put someone in the scanner who has rumination disorder, like a person with depression, you actually see more of this pattern as well, but it's much higher. Rumination tends to overactivate the default mode system which makes sense, it has to do with self-representation, self-talk and sort of meaning of the self and things like that. Now, if you look at the functional connectivity of long-term meditators and you seed, so the back hub of the default mode network, and you look at what it's connected to in meditators versus controls, it seems that now the, the default mode hub is connected to an attention monitoring system. So that has been purported as a long-term trait level change. Um, and as we can talk about after this talk, there's no pre-post long-term evidence of this. So this is just looking at long-term meditators. But the idea is not actually that there's less connectivity within the default mode, but now the default mode is connected to an attention monitoring system. So there's like a sort of system monitoring the self. And that, that sort of makes sense for a long-term practitioner. Now, there's a, a little bit of evidence that at least eight weeks of training leads to that same type of connectivity change. So this is mindfulness-based stress reduction. This is uh, Richie Davison's lab. And recently, what they've shown is relative to control uh, and a weightless control, uh, eight weeks of mindfulness-based stress reduction leads to more connectivity between the default mode hub and the attention center that I was just talking about previously. So as far as I can tell, this is the first piece of evidence that there's a relatively longer term change. Now we're still talking about eight weeks, uh, but at least within eight weeks, you do see that change. Um, and so getting back to thinking about the posterior cingulate or the default mode network as related to equanimity specifically, um, what evidence do we have to think that that actually down-regulating the posterior cingulate would increase equanimity? 
Well, uh, Judd Brewer did this really interesting study, um, I believe when he was at Yale, where he put people in the scanner and he actually showed them their brain activity in real time. So this is called fMRI neurofeedback. And this is basically what they saw. So they had a baseline task, they know what the baseline level of default mode activation is. And then if they go below that baseline in the scanner, the blue line comes on. If they go above that baseline, the red line comes on. And they were doing this clever task where they were actually trying to link in the moment by moment over 30 minutes, does that relate to the experience of the person to the phenomenology? And lo and behold, it seems to relate. And so when people who have meditation experience are in the scanner and they're actually applying a practice, so they're doing a mindfulness practice, this is what you see. In the beginning, it's like, oh my gosh, my mind is activated. I'm talking to myself. Now I'm doing the practice. And this mapped right on to them doing that practice. Now, the most salient effect was actually an effortless doing, which is a construct related to equanimity. So remember, that's that non-stickiness, the ability to sort of get some distance and let go. Um, and so this sort of non-efforting concept is related to that. It's not the same thing. But this actually continued lower than the graph. Now, here's what you see in control people who just learned how to meditate. Uh, for them, they had a lot of self-talk, a lot of self-referential processing, and a lot of mind-wandering and distraction, and that mapped right onto these red bars in moment-by-moment -moment experience. And I will say it wasn't moment-by-moment, -moment, it's three seconds delayed, four seconds delayed, because that's how MRI works. Uh, but at least to your previous um, experience, that's what people were experiencing. So we would purport here then that while people are learning um, equanimity practice or applying mindfulness practice, or if they're experiencing less uh, self-interference, if you want to think about it like that, you should see less um, default mode activation. Now, um, there's more evidence from the psychedelic literature that those regions are related to self-processing and self-identification. So the very interesting studies where they take people who typically have some, some clinical issues, they put them in the scanner and they give them psilocybin. So these are magic mushrooms. And uh, usually a pretty large dose in this study. I'm not really sure how they get people to sit still while they're having these psychedelic experiences in the scanner, but they did manage that. And basically what you see is a massive reduction in that default mode area. Again, especially in the back part in the posterior cingulate. Now what's clinically, clinically salient about that or relevant is that the more deactivation you get, the more uh, sort of non-self or self-disintegration experience people have, and that experience actually predicts positive health outcomes in the clinic up to four weeks. So there really is something about turning the system off, it seems, and the relationship between that and the felt sense of self. Now we can relate that to the concept of equanimity, of course, because if the self is not grasping onto things or resisting things, you're experiencing the sensory world as it's unfolding uh, in the brain. The problem uh, with psychedelic literature and the mindfulness literature and looking at the default mode, if you look past about four weeks to eight weeks, it's really hard to see longer term changes in the system. And so uh, a couple studies have actually tried to combine psychedelics with mindfulness training. Uh, so these people are going through a five-day mindfulness retreat, mindfulness-based stress reduction type retreat, and they're doing um, one dose of psilocybin at the end. And they're doing what's called open awareness meditation, which is related to equanimity. And basically what you see is that during the application of the mindfulness training, you have a reduction in the default mode network. Um, and it's during the practice, I want to point out. But what's really interesting is that if you look at the changes, so pre to post at five days, the only significant effect you see then in the default mode network is with an interaction between taking psilocybin and doing the mindfulness practice. So they're comparing mindfulness practice and a placebo pill to mindfulness practice plus psilocybin, and that's where you see this five-day change. So mindfulness plus placebo actually didn't change the default mode activity at all. Um, and again, this is while people are meditating in the, in the scanner um, again. And so then if you look at long-term changes, so they looked at four months, uh, you see that those changes while you're meditating in the scanner at day five actually predicts uh, longer-term changes on this scale called the, called the positive persistent effect scale. Um, 
Now, what's really interesting about that is actually at rest, these meditators, if they had increased uh, default mode activation, that actually predicted positive health outcomes. So at five days, if you increase the connectivity in the meditator plus psilocybin, that increased connectivity actually predicts positive health outcomes. That's really interesting to me because what that suggests is that um, during meditation, you may want to down-regulate the default mode network to down-regulate the integrity of the system, but afterwards, you don't want that to persist. You actually may want increased connectivity, which relates to the sort of flexibility of the default mode network. Um, so that, that was that point where I was saying we don't want to permanently change the, the connectivity. We just want to help people experience less default mode during meditation training. And so with that, uh, we developed the hypothesis that we should be able to first induce equanimity like states by inhibiting the default mode network. Um, so these are healthy subjects, they're not meditating. And then if that worked, then we would try it in a meditation training paradigm. So the basic idea is doing resting state fMRI connectivity. We took people out of the scanner in this point and did inhibition of the posterior cingulate for 10 minutes. And then we put people back in the scanner to look at resting state connectivity. Uh, this is only in six subjects, so this is a pilot study. But within those six subjects, we saw massive changes in default mode network connectivity, uh, functional connectivity. So blue here is showing decrease relative to baseline. So after the intervention, uh, basically our, our connectivity between these two regions was massively decreased. And also the precuneus, so the connectivity between the PCC and the precuneus changed as well. So then if you ask the subjects what their experience was like, uh, most of them experienced less self-talk. Uh, time seemed to go by effortlessly and very fast. And it was very easy for them to be in the scanner. So um, if you think you're increasing equanimity in that, in that environment, that's what you might expect. If they, they're uncomfortable in the scanner, they can let that go pretty easily. And so we used um, a mindfulness scale that looks at decentering. That's that concept I brought up earlier, which is basically awareness of one's experience with some distance rather than being carried away by one's thoughts and feelings. This is related to equanimity. It's not the same thing. But what we found in this scale is that relative to baseline, these six subjects significantly increase. This is just a t-test that we're looking at here. There's no control at this point. Um, but we did find a significant increase in decentering, which suggests that that concept of equanimity was increasing. So um, we also wanted to look at EEG. There have been EEG measures of the default mode network as well. And the basic finding is that when default mode activates, you get more 10 hertz in the EEG, so more, uh, more alpha activity. The basic hypothesis is that if we inhibited now the prefrontal part of the default mode network, again, we should be able to decrease a measure of the integrity of the default mode network. And that's exactly what we found. So this was in seven subjects, another pilot experiment. And uh, we were able to change that 10 hertz alpha. So purple means decrease. Uh, there was a significant effect in alpha, theta, and beta. And if we plot that uh, scalp EEG activity on the surface of the cortex, we find that our medial prefrontal cortex hub of the default mode network, as well as the back, the PCC, and the precuneus, those major hubs were down-regulated, as well as some um, parietal areas um, as well. And then my friend, the um, right inferior frontal gyrus, was also down-regulated. So when you're looking at purple, these are all significant effects that are showing up from that intervention. Um, we also tried to source estimate into those hubs in the default mode network. So basically, this is looking at the medial prefrontal cortex hub and then the back, the PCC, and trying to estimate where that EEG is coming from. These are imperfect measures, but we wanted to see uh, if we get the same effect. And what we found is that at baseline, people are in the default mode, it seems. You see alpha, 10 hertz. And then after the ultrasound, to the prefrontal cortex, you see a massive significant reduction again. And then if we look at how these brain areas are communicating, we seem to be reducing the communication between those two hubs in the network. Now, you might ask, what was the experience of these subjects? Turns out that these subjects had no phenomenology experiences. They said they were basically just bored in this task. 
And so that's pretty interesting when thinking about the sort of network and what the back for, versus the front hub is doing. Um, we can talk about that in the question and answer. So um, we basically have a general, um, a general phenomenon where it seems like we can inhibit both of the hubs of the default mode network and it relates to experiences that are similar to equanimity. Now, the next step is, of course, to do this while people are training in meditation to see if it boosts the meditation practice. Uh, the other area that we were really interested in looking at, uh, which you might be surprised to hear, was actually the basal ganglia. Uh, so the cortico-basal ganglia habit formation system. And that's because um, we were looking at this very fascinating disorder of motivation called athymhormia. So basically, these patients get bilateral damage to the thalamocortical prefrontal loop, uh, thalamocortical basal ganglia prefrontal loop. And if you get damage on both sides, you get this really fascinating disorder where patients uh, seem to be completely cognitively, emotionally uh, spared. So they're fine if you give them any kind of task um, for the most part, but they don't self-motivate. So they have no internal motivation to do almost literally anything. So if they come into the office and you're a doctor, they'll just sit there for like 12 hours without doing anything, without using the bathroom, getting water. If you say, hey, Bob, what's up? Bob says, I'm just sitting here waiting for you. So, you know, they're, they're completely cognitively aware, but they can't activate their own behavior. So Shenzhen and I were looking at this and thinking, well, this is pretty interesting because if you look at the case reports, it looks like they have a dysfunctional level of equanimity they're letting go a little bit too much. Um, so here's one patient who actually got sunburned and um, they brought her into the ER and they said, well, you've got really severe burns, what's going on with you? And she basically says something like, well, it was really bad pain uh, that really hurt, but it didn't make me suffer. So what's the point of getting out of the sun? Uh, so Shenzhen and I looked at this and went, oh, wait a minute, this is very interesting. If we can manipulate this circuitry and lead to an effect that's similar, not, not this extreme, of course, but if we can give people a taste of that while they're trying to meditate, that might significantly boost their practice. So um, do we have any evidence that we can get ultrasound to the basal ganglia? We're trying to go to the head of the caudate nucleus. There is one study uh, with a, a couple subjects, I think actually one subject, where they ultrasounded in a 7T scanner and they actually could modulate the, the head of the caudate. So uh, we decided to cautiously do this in our first long-term meditation practitioner, which was Shenzhen Young. As you can see, uh, he's wearing a sort of goofy looking device, which is helping me steer the ultrasound beam right to his basal ganglia, which is here. We did this bilateral on Shenzhen over a couple week period, and Shenzhen reported um, states that were very much in the direction of deep equanimity. Um, so that really got us excited because then we thought, okay, this seems to be safe in, in Shenzhen. Let's now try this in a couple other long-term meditation practitioners and really try it while they're meditating. So um, we moved into five long-term meditators. It's a bit difficult to find people who have this much meditation experience. Um, we again did neuro navigation. So we targeted to the bilateral head of the caudate nucleus and we did this over four days. And the basic finding with that same scale is that we could significantly increase that level of decentering. Now, you will notice if you're watching carefully that uh, long-term meditators have a much higher level of baseline uh, decentering. That makes sense. Uh, you would expect that. But even from that high level, we were able to increase it even more. And then I like to give this fun uh, word cloud, which basically I had them self-report, do a little phenomenology report after each session. And then the bigger words are just the more times that they're actually using these phrases. And so you get an overall sense of the experience of these five people, which was, it felt good. It was much of a body sensation. Uh, there was sort of vibration and peacefulness and happiness and um, a little bit of equanimity is in there as well. And so this demonstrates, at least while people are trying to meditate, <clears throat> that this tended to boost that meditation practice. So, so we have a little bit of pilot data, and now we're trying to move from there into actually applying this during clinical practice. And we really want to know, can we go from inducing those states to enhancing those meditation skills, the trait level of those skills? 
Now, uh, our basic paradigm in the lab is to move from basic science, so testing safety and efficacy and replicating what we've done with bigger studies, to um, actually moving to combining this with mindfulness training to see if relative to sham or placebo, can we accelerate the outcomes? Um, then we want to, if that works and that's safe, we want to move to clinical translation where we're looking at this in chronic pain and addiction. And that's actually what we were gearing up to do right before the uh, coronavirus pandemic hit. And so we will continue that afterwards. Um, and then if that works and we can show some efficacy within eight weeks, we really want to start looking beyond eight weeks and looking in healthy populations. We can move beyond the clinic. And so in these studies, uh, we'd be doing these in the retreat setting at first and asking within an eight week paradigm, do we see longer term effects over six months or a year, um, or maybe even longer if we can get the funding. And then if that's possible, uh, as Dr. Khan said, there's all kinds of interesting philosophical challenges that will begin to emerge as we as we grow this paradigm to larger and larger populations. For example, uh, how fast is too fast? Is this a shortcut? Um, we're talking about the default mode network, which is involved in self-identification and self-processing. Uh, so is this an egoectomy? Um, are we taking away the social and embodied elements of mindfulness training? And what about something like spiritual bypass? What if we give people really good concentration powers but we sort of sidestep their unresolved emotional issues, their psychological wounds, um, or just undeveloped psychological um, growth in general. So um, when Shinzen and I think about this and talk about this, which we do a lot, uh, we talked about it all weekend before this talk, for example, you know, one thing we come back to is in the beginning, we're doing this in an eight week course and we're really adding on to the practice. And so we're looking at the expected outcomes first of those eight week courses of mindfulness training and asking, can we boost those outcomes? So the expected outcomes you get in eight weeks, can we get those in four, for example? That's kind of how we're, we're taking a chunk of this problem in the beginning. And so we're adding to the practice and then we're looking at all of these different levels of um, quantification to ask, you know, in the eight week courses, do we see the same changes in the neurobiology? And also, are we not leading to any other negative side effects? We don't want to give you hyper attention at the cost of linguistic function, for example. We want to make sure you can use your language just as you could before, but now you can focus better on what you're saying. Um, and that goes all the way up to the psychosocial trait level changes that we're ultimately interested in. So um, it sort of zooms out from there for us as well, because we're not just thinking about a human being as these multiple quantified levels but you also have to think about the human being um, from a holistic psychosocial point of view. You have to think about the whole human being. And so uh, we're, we're looking for ways to quantify these larger psychosocial outcomes for people as well. Um, and Shenzhen has actually developed this really interesting um, table, which he calls the periodic table of happiness elements. And these are sort of the broad and deep levels of change. So uh, psychological change to changes in identity that you might expect if you increase those meditation skills like concentration and clarity. And so um, it goes sort of this way here across these levels. And then as you amplify concentration, clarity, and equanimity, you actually move down these levels. And so we're actually looking for um, met metrics like this and other metrics out of the happiness uh, science that's emerging to ensure that we're not creating a situation where a patient is psychologically bypassing some of the deep work that needs to be done. And actually the longer term outcomes are actually occurring for that person, uh, you know, as defined by them in the culture that they're in. So we need to sort of think very broadly about this as well. Um, and for my final slide, I think we're coming up on the hour, really what we want to do. So if, if we can see that enhancing uh, equanimity by reducing the default mode network, for example, actually helps people gain the benefits over eight weeks faster, uh, we really want to take this into a two-month protocol where uh, we do some baseline measures, um, so behavioral and neuroimaging, fMRI. Then we would bring patients into the lab in the clinic. We would give them the introduction, like the periodic table of happiness elements. So their psychological set, their mental set is sort of ready for expecting what should happen. 
Uh, then we give them some basic mindfulness training over the first week. Weeks two to four, they get sonication sessions, the ultrasound sessions, plus the training. So they're actually wearing a head unit, they're trying to meditate, and we're down-regulating the default mode network. After that four weeks, we do some more testing. Um, then we give them training alone. So hopefully we boosted the practice and now they're motivated to stick with it without the ultrasound. Uh, so now we're looking at weeks four to eight. We do some more behavioral and neuroimaging testing if we have lots of money. Um, then if there is a deep change, so if we're talking about a deep change to self-representation, uh, self-identification and the sort of loosening of those systems, so equanimity can prevail and they can get some sort of relief and healing from their problems. Um, then we wanna give them personal support. So we have different ways of doing this, but we'd probably give them, uh, if, if these are clinical populations, they'd have clinical assistance so they could come to the clinic if they need it uh, or have a phone call, as well as we give them mindfulness coaches who are trained to help people integrate these changes to the sense of self. So uh, that's over the six month period um, or longer if we have more funding. And then finally, at the very end, we'd wanna do follow up again to look at the longer term changes. So do we see changes in the neurobiology, for example, from the posterior cingulate to the DLPFC, that attention hub, does that change persist? And does the strength of that change actually predict the health uh, and behavioral outcomes? And that's really where we want to go from there. Then, of course, we could use that information to retool our stimulation protocol um, because, of course, one of the beauties of using direct brain stimulation is that we're, we're actually testing how these brain areas relate to these outcomes. And so we're actually using the scientific paradigm to retool this clinical intervention to make it work more effectively and move in the direction of these outcomes that we're interested in. So uh, that's the dream if we have all of our money. Um, if we can find it other ways other than Silicon Valley, that's what we're uh, funding. So just to wrap up, uh, transcranial focused ultrasound to the default mode network reduces fun functional connectivity, which is correlated with enhanced decentering, a uh, proxy measure for equanimity. Uh, the same protocol actually to the caudate nucleus leads to a decentering like state as well. And we'd like to actually look at the connectivity in the MRI. And so now the question we're moving into is does combining transcranial focused ultrasound with mindfulness training actually accelerate the acquisition of those mindfulness skills? If that's true, does that actually lead to the positive health outcomes in the clinic and beyond that we're really fundamentally interested in? So with that, uh, I just want to thank all the collaborators on this project. As we move forward, uh, the, the list of collaborators is growing, it seems exponentially at this point. And uh, we are open to new collaborators. We need lots of help on this. And as soon as we develop the paradigm, we'll hope to replicate in other labs uh, to get independent replication of what we're working on. So if you're interested, definitely reach out to me and uh, we can have a conversation about that. Uh, this is what the current iteration of the device looks like. So this is our, our resident model, uh, Shenzhen Young who's wearing the focused ultrasound transducer, and he's actually getting mindfulness training piped in through the headphones. Um, ultimately, this device can be worn in the scanner, in the MRI scanner as well, with you know, different metal, of course. Um, so we can actually look at how this is changing uh, in real time. Okay, so thanks for listening. I think what we'll do now is Rael's, Dr. Khan is going to uh, look at the questions. And uh, I guess we'll sift through um, and he'll take a couple questions. And I just want to reiterate uh, that Shenzhen is on the call. I think you should see his face there as well. So if you have directed questions for Shenzhen, he can answer those too. Thank you so much, Jake. Uh, wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, and we do have uh, uh, some significant time to uh, have questions and answers. Um, and uh, also, I think some of the questions uh, might deserve answers, both from, uh, from the more scientific angle, as well as from the more contemplative practitioner teacher angle that you can uh, provide Shinzen. So um, uh, let me uh, just ask that while I kind of moderate the questions, Jay and Shinzen, if you guys could turn off your volumes, just because there's, you know, this cross cross volume can be a problem. Um, 
And then uh, let's just see the first question here. Um, so Deborah Natoli, one of uh, our center's uh, steering committee members uh, had asked um, a question related to a friend of hers uh, who has been receiving, uh, she, she mentioned trans, transcranial ultrasound treatment six weeks for depression. I think it might actually be transcranial magnetic stimula stimulation because I don't think anyone is clinically offering in a kind of standardized way in St. Louis um, this transcranial ultrasound protocol that is very much experimental in a lab as of yet. Um, but what she noted is that her friend said, you know, it's getting more painful as the, um, the sessions go on. So while you're not doing transcranial magnetic uh, uh, stimulation, uh, which is, you know, now an FDA approved uh, treatment for uh, treatment resistant depression. I think the same question may be of relevance um, in terms of, you know, the possibility for discomfort and pain uh, with this kind of an intervention. Um, so they're probably referring to physical pain. Is that how you're understanding? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we had TMS uh, at the lab at University of New Mexico. So Shenzhen and I have tried this on ourselves and I've actually run a few experiments with this technology. It's a very strong magnet that induces about a half, half a Tesla field up to a Tesla field. So it's an extremely strong magnet. And uh, what you can do is you can actually evoke motor potential. So if I find your motor cortex, I can actually cause your finger to twitch. That's how powerful this is. For depression, they're typically doing that over the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, that same area that I was describing in my talk. Um, and because of that, it actually causes your facial muscles to tense. Uh, and Shenzhen and I experienced this often in the lab when we were using this. That's very uncomfortable for people on multiple levels. It's actually painful. Um, you get a sort of startle response from it. And uh, some patients actually have a psychological sort of philosophical issue because it's something controlling your brain from the outside. And, it, and it's very clear. So it's sort of, there's lots going on there. With ultrasound, the advantage here, <clears throat> excuse me, is that you actually don't feel anything. So the subjects don't know when the ultrasound is on versus off um, in theory. Now the ultrasound actually causes a little bit of reverberation in the skull, which I know sounds a little scary, but it's just the sound wave sort of moving around the skull. Uh, younger people can hear that. So they're hearing 500 kilohertz reduced down to about you know, 20,000 hertz. Um, but other than that, if you mask that sound, you actually don't know, you don't feel anything from the ultrasound. So that's a huge advantage from a scientific point of view because uh, it leads to less expectation effects. Like if I'm magnetically stimulating you and you're you're twitching every time, you know, every time that that thing is on. Um, in my study, a lot of my subjects actually think they're all in the placebo condition um, because they don't feel or hear anything. They just say, well, you, I'm the placebo. So it's really interesting. You know, we usually see 60 to 80% of subjects reporting that they believed they were placebo. Great, thanks. That it, it is, does sound like a real advantage over the TMS, which um, you know I've, I've heard from patients. Really, uh, some people do find it to be too uh, uncomfortable to to uh, to go through with the full protocol. Um, uh, here's a real brief one: uh, Can I volunteer for the study? How would I do so? Hey, that's a question we get often. <laughs> um, we were hoping to actually be able to invite volunteers for this study that we were planning on starting in April of this year. We had funding for that. Uh, we were about to hit the ground running when the coronavirus hit. Um, and part of that study, so that was the two, the, the two month study. Um, part of that was actually to do a little bit of uh, case study reports. So taking long-term meditators as well as new meditators and maybe doing an individual protocol and looking at the phenomenology. Now, I'm, I really believe in objective measures and my background is in visual neuroscience, so I know how to really tweak objective measures. But I also think that the phenomenology is really important to capture and trying to relate those two. So uh, for that, we would actually have been able to invite people, we could consent them into the study and they could be sort of uh, case study uh, reports from our lab. Um, but right now, our, our IRB, like I think most um, review boards, are not approving studies for humans because of the coronavirus situation. 
So uh, we're putting that in and we're just going to wait until we can run new subjects. But at that point, we actually will be able to bring people in. Um, so I have a couple of other ones uh, that might be kind of combined. A few people have asked uh, something that I can quickly answer if this uh, talk will be available in some form uh, after. And we will be posting it on the Center for Mindfulness Science website, uh, which is mindfulscience.usc.edu under a section past events where we have all of our uh, past speakers um, presentations uh, uh, uploaded. So that might take a week or so, but it will certainly be up there. Um, one uh, question related to the, the pain question is, uh, Although I think you've clearly answered that, you know, one advantage is there's not physical pain. Were there any other adverse experiences that participants have reported uh, in your work uh, to date? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, most of my experiments that I've run have been in the mood manipulation category, so trying to develop that intervention for depression. Uh, we ran a total of almost 300 subjects, and uh, we had no negative uh, so if something bad happens in the lab in terms of a negative event, you have to report that to the ethics committee at your university. Um, so we didn't have anything like that happen. There were no, uh, you know, migraines to anything worse. Uh, we did have a couple participants have very interesting experiences. Um, so we had one location that was a control site to try to control from the right IFG, and one patient experienced um, an extreme state of flow. Uh, for example, which we did actually report to the IRB just because we weren't predicting that. Um, since the patient had a good experience or the subject had a good experience, that was okay. Now, when moving into the mindfulness groups, meditators, most, so, so basically 99% of them uh, really have enjoyed this and it's been a very positive experience. We had one participant who uh, had some anxiety states that seemed to be released which often happens with mindfulness anyway. So if you go on a retreat for five days and you sit, focus on your internal states, um, you know, for 10 hours a day, you might have some things like anxiety come up. So this was relatively normal for this person, um, but it came up pretty significantly. And because they were a long-term practitioner, they could actually deal with that. So that's one of the reasons we started with Shenzhen first uh, and then moved backwards to other long-term practitioners is we really wanted to make sure in case something like that happened, they had the tools to actually deal with that. So we'll continue to monitor that as we move into the clinic, um, which obviously clinical populations will have other problems they're dealing with. Um, a couple of the uh, questions are really uh, for Shenzhen. And in particular, a few people are interested to hear you talk a little bit about your experience uh, while having some of these specific brain areas um, targeted. Um, maybe you have also an appreciation <coughs> for the difference between the experiential domain uh, when different areas were being targeted. Um, and then also a kind of um, more detailed question in regards to that phenomenology, a kind of preface is it seems that changes in self-representation may be more prominent when the practice involves systematically intentionally looking for what we call I instead of only paying uh, attention to the contents of awareness. So um, this is regarding you know the, the mindfulness protocol that you either have done or have in mind to do in combination with the, the stimulation, um, the, the transcranial ultrasound. So does the practice that you're planning to use involve turning attention away from what's in awareness to awareness itself, or is it expected to happen on its own? So the first question was my personal experience <clears throat> with the ultrasound. And the second uh, was um, uh, what technique are we planning on having people use? Um, uh, are they just going to uh, pay attention broadly to whatever, or will there be uh, something that might be more likely to uh, create an insight around self and so forth? 
that might be incorporated into the technique? Are we going to do something like that? They're asking um, <clears throat> that question. I think I got both questions correct. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm very reticent to talk about my personal experiences with the ultrasound um, in public. That doesn't mean I don't do it. I do do it. I have to do it. We're scientists. Um, but I just want to make this big preamble. I am very hesitant to do this. I do this with trepidation. Um, of course, there's the obvious. I'm one person. I'm hugely invested in a certain uh, scientific project working uh, psychologically, emotionally. Um, and um, I'm not exactly a representative of most people that we are going to be working with. Most people have not lived in Asian monasteries for years and years and years and done old school practice um, essentially for 50 years and before that another 10 years learning the languages of Asia. I'm not your normal subject by any means. So there's the obvious, this is not representative uh, in terms of the demographic here. But that's actually not why I'm reticent to talk about my experiences in public. The reason I'm reticent to talk about it is they were stunning. Just stunning. Not subtle. Um, and I don't want to create a flood of irresponsible actions of people starting to mess around with ultrasound um, because it's already happened twice. As soon as I started to talk about this, two students are on eBay buying some old ultrasound equipment. Um, I don't want to create a fad that then becomes a research winter um, by talking this up. Um, but yet I have to be honest. Um, I've been at this my whole life. You can look me up on the internet. Um, I remember, oh, I don't know, maybe at about session four or five, uh, Jay and I have been at this for a couple of years now. <laughs> We've done a lot. Um, I remember thinking, oh, yeah, this is what I've been trying to do for the last 50 years. It just seemed vectorially aligned with my experience as um, a senior mindfulness teacher. It's, it just seems to be the right direction. So the natural question is, can we make it much stronger in that direction so that it facilitates all and only the old goodies that this practice is supposed to bring uh, without creating too many of the old baddies that we know to expect the negative consequences of meditation we have those listed and documented. We have the prophylactic measures and the <clears throat> treatment measures in place. And we have professional mindfulness coaches monitoring the students looking for these things. So the issue is, can we uh, bring about not just some, but the full qualitative and depth range of the traditional positive uh, effects on human well-being while uh, <clears throat> and we know what happens with these practices traditionally the pitfalls that people go through the dark night the pit of the void the someone mentioned uh, uh, bypassing 
Um, you can use this stuff to develop psychopathy tendencies. We don't want that. So there's a, a long list of old baddies. We want to make sure that we're taking measures from the get-go to make those less likely to happen because if we accelerate the goodies, sure, we may accelerate the baddies, but we know what the ba old baddies are. We know what to look for. We know how to militate against their occurrence, how to ameliorate them if they do occur. So the idea is to uh, uh, accelerate the practice that way. Um, so um, my experience was of everything that I ever tried, and I did try everything, um, including I was there in Haight-Ashbury when it all started, <laughs> uh, the summer of love, that's when I got turned on to drugs and so forth. Um, uh, I tried everything, um, but this seems more, it's the only thing that seems, vec the only phrase I can use is vectorially aligned, just seems to be pointing in the right direction. But, so that's encouraging, um, but scientifically perhaps not that significant. Uh, in fact, not significant at all. <laughs> uh, this is not science yet. This is just one person's anecdote. So that's what I would say about that. Um, as far as what technique, that's interesting because <clears throat> it implies that we would only teach one technique. But <clears throat> I want to do something that in the end is going to work well. And it's been my experience that different approaches work in different ways for different people at different times. So we're actually not going to teach them one technique. We're going to teach them a set of techniques with an algorithm for um, different applications in daily life. You can use this technique in this way, in this situation to reduce uh, your emotional distress. You can use actually the same technique with a slightly different emphasis to deal with behavior change. On the other hand, for this other thing, we'll teach you how to do this. And we have not only a periodic table of the effects that we want uh, in the long term, but we also have a periodic table of uh, world contemplative techniques cross-classified and a way of uh, uh, integrating them so that they seem like a, a single uh, endeavor. So uh, we, uh, I know you would tend to think, well, you just give one technique because you uh, want to keep the science simple. And we may have to do that at the beginning, but in the end, we want them to internalize an algorithm that uh, deals with windows and walls. That, that's very helpful. And I'm just gonna uh, come in here because the, there's a couple of uh, questions, um, including one thing that I wanted to bring up by my, myself and a couple others are kind of echoing with a, a different emphasis, but I think it really gets at the kind of, uh, you know, philosophical challenges, which you actually did address in your, uh, in your response just now, Shinzen. And I mean, I think it's also worth noting that the um, the most widespread uh, applications of mindfulness practices for clinical uh, applications are uh, are exactly what you described. You know, a set of practices, starting with John Kabat-Zinn's development of the mindfulness-based stress reduction, which includes both focused attentional practice as well as more open awareness practices and body-based practices with yoga, etc. Um, but a real kind of critical uh, set of questions I just wanted to read out. Um, one is, you know, the concern that what you are targeting as equanimity, um, you know, the the danger, dark side that, you know, you could think of it as, and you even drew the direct comparison to passivity uh, or athymormia. And, you know, especially the encouragement of that kind of state using neurostimulation uh, might have more danger than the development of 
the equanimous state of mind through the kind of discipline self application of uh, attentional uh, engagement through kind of more standard mindfulness practices uh, of, from the ages. Um, so in particular, you know, the, I think the kind of dark scenario that many people in the mindfulness field uh, kind of envision and fear is that you know in the in the face of the many uh, social uh, challenges uh, in the world now, this interconnected world of ours, uh, including uh, the uh, commodification of, uh, of of cultures and ideas, uh, and the you know the degradation of human social relations um, and uh, our relationship to the environment, you know the the danger that somehow. Uh, mindfulness practices generally, or especially mindfulness practices as enhanced through these kinds of um, these kind of techniques, might lead people into some state of uh, passivity in the face of uh, social changes that um, really should be fought against. <laughs> if you think about it in the kind of global sense of what what we can do as a human species and uh, and you know within our each of our individual societies. To really help each other evolve uh, in the the most harmonious and positive way. Um, yes. And then, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and we have four minutes, and you're not done asking the question. I apologize, but, the, but that, that, uh, it's I'll related tell you the, to yeah. it's related to these other two ways of of posing it. Um, so one would be. Uh, how did Leah Bacharain and, and Jeff Sugar. Um, so Jeff mentioned, you know, first, thank you for the excellent presentation. It seems that one of the most significant contributions you're making is to clarify the processes that occur during meditative practice. However, is there any concern about commodifying meditation practice in the same way insurance companies try to regulate the practice of medicine in general, psychiatry specifically to provide not the best, but the quickest, most efficient treatment? Is there a concern meditation, meditation practice could become decoupled from the traditions that protect it? And in addition, uh, given that uh, the discipline requ requirement to sit daily has been considered integral to dying to the false self, or illusion of identifying self as thoughts and feelings, are you concerned that hacking a shortcut offers states that might not yield traits? And can you discuss means and ends in that, um, in that kind of framework? Yes, for the next three or four years, I would say. Uh, but aren't we out of time? Maybe if you could just give you know, a, a one minute response. Come on. <laughs> This is a bundle of huge and wonderful questions. It's not one question. And we have, this is, there's no quick response to this one other than let's schedule the next conversation. This, this is delicious. Um, it's becoming very clear what the issues are um, for some people. And I think Jay and I definitely have opinions, but uh, exactly two minutes by the clock is not the best way to give them. Well, I, I think that's a very understandable, appropriate answer. Thank you, Shinza. I apologize for uh, trying to fit it in at the end. No, um, you should know thank you, because this is what we really wanted to do. Uh, yeah. But we also so, had to do some other stuff. Right. I'd love to have you back sometime uh, before too long uh, to speak at least for the center and um, and thank you both very much and I'll, I'll give it over. There's a, a few kind of housekeeping uh, matters for the department that I think yes. take place now. So thank you once again. Thanks again. Thanks Dr. Khan. So just in closing, um, thank you all who have attended today's talk and I'd like to especially thank Dr. Um, Sanguinetti and Shinzen for the wonderful presentation and the work you're doing. And Dr. Khan, thank you for coordinating this in conjunction with the sponsorship of uh, USC Center for Mindfulness. It does sound like you need a part two to really focus in on these philosophical questions. Um, 
And I also see Gretchen has posted the information for CME and CE credit. Just so people know who are filling out the surveys, we are looking at the responses and the feedback very carefully. And if you um, think that there's been anything missing from these presentations or that they haven't been useful, it would be very helpful for you to elaborate further on that. Um, for the most part, they've been incredibly positive. And um, please join in for Department of Psychiatry faculty, uh, trainees and staff next week will be the last in our COVID special series with Tom Kozakowski talking about conflict resolution during the pandemic. So thank you once again, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you. So long, everyone. Thanks for checking. Bye-bye. Thanks. Good work. Thanks again, Jay. Nice to meet you. Oh, thank you. Thanks for the invitation. This was a lot of fun. Really great. Yeah. Appreciate the work you're doing and a lot of room more for discussion. So definitely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much.